morning. I live with my wife, Angela, and four children on a tenanted 1,700-acre mountain farm in Mid Wales. It's a very isolated farm. Um, for example, we have no electricity, we have to generate our own, we use a mixture of diesel, wind and solar. My family have farmed and lived and farmed on the same farm for 150 years. Around seven years ago, when older sheep were worth very little, we launched Ellen Valley Mutton, um, selling the older cow ewes at a premium to high quality butchers, restaurants, food festivals and farmers markets. It was a niche business, but it expanded very quickly. It was very profitable, uh, but it wasn't easy. Uh, Mutton has a very poor reputation, but we had lots of help from an organization called the Mutton Renaissance Campaign. Over the last three or four years, fortunately for sheep farmers, sheep prices have really been rising, um, really because of differences in global supply and demand. Unfortunately for our business, this has caused our profits to fall. We were struggling to increase um, our retail prices enough to absorb these extra uh, price of the carcasses. What could I do? Obviously, I applied for a Nuffield scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> My plan was to travel around the world visiting businesses who were openly selling mutton at a premium. It was a difficult subject to research. I found mutton dressed as lamb and lamb dressed as mutton before I even left home. <laughs> but I did start in the USA. In Kentucky, they were cooking mutton carcasses in the restaurants um, in sort of over wood in these large ovens for up to 12 hours. They created a food tourism destination around what they described as barbecued mutton. I've heard several stories of how this tradition started. Uh, my favorite story was that the early settlers were Welsh sheep farmers and they generously donated the older sheep to church barbecues. <laughs> <laughs> mutton was on the menu in most places in, in that area. Um, I sampled lots. I was really impressed by, by the, the, the special taste. My brain was really working overtime. I, I was so inspired um, on ideas like a take home and implement back in the UK. Uh, Tony's barbecue mutton was going to go nationwide. <laughs> Ken Bosley, who actually cooks over 120 old ewes in his restaurant every week, he said that if you could put your preconceptions to one side, you'd enjoy mutton. If you really <coughs> love food, he said, you love mutton. He was having a problem. Over the last two or three years, the price of carcasses has trebled. And he was blaming this on extra demand from the cities on the east coast of the USA. <coughs> so I visited the eastern wholesale market in Detroit, where there was supposedly a mixture of American and Australian mutton for sale. I recognized this dark red mutton immediately. <coughs> But when I inquired, I was told it was lamb. <coughs> when I ex explained that I was a, a mutton-obsessed sheep farmer, they said, well, actually, it's all mutton. <laughs> Whether it was called lamb or mutton just depended wholly on the color of your skin. It was then that I really decided that I needed to do some research in a, another direction as well. So I thought I'd probably look at the, the Muslim markets as well. But firstly, on to China with the biggest sheep flock in the world, you know, a visit was essential. Translation difficulties did make research quite challenging in China, but it was a fascinating experience visiting the, the country which is having such an effect on the rest of the world. Most meat in China is still sold in wet food markets on a daily basis. There is no refrigeration in the rural areas. Um, this was described as mutton, but <laughs> this isn't a child. <laughs> With the head shepherd of a government sheep research station in Mongolia. But what I did discover there was that the older sheep were actually going into the cities. 
of being the Chinese Muslim population. There were somewhere between 20 and 50 million Chinese Muslims. I was completely unaware of this until I went to Inner Mongolia. Cambodia, one of the poorest countries on the planet. Um, the farmers, the typical farmers, um, they're all on stilts because it only rains there once a year, but when it does, it doesn't stop, but it rains somewhere for five meters of rain. Um, the only sheep in Cambodia were kept by the Muslim population uh, for their own use. They all in small flocks of about five sheep, which was just the right number to keep a Muslim family in sheep meat for the various celebrations and festivals uh, in the Islamic calendar. They also imported um, Australian mutton, which is what I ate in the cities there. Um, really, they only imported the cheap Australian mutton cuts. Um, it's really just to help feed a hungry population. India, more vegetarians than the rest of the world put together. Not a great place to go and research mutton, you would think. <laughs> but 60 million sheep. And also, being a fan of mutton curry, I was very happy. <laughs> this was Shearing Day in the mountains of Rajasthan in India. Um, these Hindu farmers were vegetarian. Now, they sold their sheep to traders who sold them to the Muslim customers. They didn't want to think of their sheep actually being eaten. Um, I thought they were very lucky having 100 million Muslim customers on the doorstep. Back in the UK, 95% of sheep are sold through livestock markets. These two pens of Culdews in Welshpool Market are a good example of how sometimes sheep aren't always presented for sale in the perfect condition. There's no difference in them. Culdews, which are an important part of stock sales of a sheep farm, are quite often considered as a byproduct, and they are literally, you know, when the lambs are weaned, they're just taken to the market and sold. Now, mutton accounts for 13% of all sheep meat in the UK. Where does it go? Do you eat it? The Muslim population in the UK, 3 and 4%, by my estimates, consume three quarters of all the mutton. And it's the descendants of India and Pakistan who are the consumers of mutton. Due to their um, religious beliefs, all the meat has to be halal certified. The one thing missing in the, the Hanal butcher shops in the UK I found was any promotional marketing material um, promoting British mutton. When I introduced myself as a, a sheep farmer, the, the butchers were always very surprised that they'd never met a sheep farmer before. Uh, they had no idea where they, their meat came from. Also, if you've ever eaten a lamb, um, dish from an Indian takeaway, or a donut kebab, or any processed meal with lamb as an ingredient, you will probably eat a mutton. If you've ever had a lamb dinner in a prison, it was probably New Zealand mutton. <laughs> we are the, the UK are New Zealand's biggest customer of mutton, the largest single customer of mutton. We also export mutton to France for the halal market. <coughs> and to Germany for the huge Donna Kebab market. My recommendations. Culliews are always sold on a headage basis. If they were sold by weight and weight in the livestock markets, there would be more transparency and there could be better benchmarking of prices. And this will hopefully pass on to us sheep farmers and we may present the sheep in better condition. Livestock markets should be weighing cull news. A lot of work needs to be done to promote UK mutton to the halal consumers. The levy boards could do more. We need to create some loyalty to British mutton. What can I do about this? Well, I thought I'd start at the top. <laughs> we were recently very fortunate to have His Royal Highness Prince Charles come to visit our farm. He was very interested in my natural scholarship, and when I suggested one of my outcomes was that the British sheep industry needs to work closer with the, the Muslim community, he replied, 
I don't talk now, I'm a Muslim council, and he took some notes. <laughs> Back to my business. The value of sheep is still rising every year. Um, for example, the Kalyu price in the UK in 2007 was £23. I think this week it's about £60. My study has sort of led me to believe that this is even going to increase more in the future. Uh, the Muslim population in Europe is increasing very fast. Because of the difficulties in adding value to a product which is becoming more expensive, we've actually taken this decision through this last year and we discontinued yellow valley mutton um, and selling mutton to westerners. The halal food chain is really efficient, so I'm not even going to try and compete with that, but um, I'm working with them now by supplying sheep um, during the various festivals when the, the demand is at the greatest. Also, the need to generate my own electricity developed a passion in renewable energies with me. My wife Angela, who did an absolutely brilliant job in managing the farm and the family um, while I was away on the Napier Travels, has actually kindly agreed for me to have some more time off to go and study. Um, I'm now studying for a Master's in Renewable Energy. Without any doubt, I would not have had the confidence to make these changes if I had not undertaken a Napier Scholarship. And I would like to thank the World Welsh Agricultural Society for sponsoring me. Thank you very much.